there's a lot that I've learned about her over the years. And I've just been really determined to write her history ever since. Nanny Helen Burroughs is one of the most influential black women in the history of the U.S. labor movement. Yet too many people have never heard her name. Meet the Rutgers professor who's working to change that, next on A Third of Your Life. You spend a third of your life at work. We're all about making it better. This is the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations podcast. She built a national school to establish new career pathways for black women and girls, created the first labor organization for black women, fought for voting rights, and even found time to write plays. Nanny Helen Burroughs should be a household name, and one Rutgers professor is trying to make that a reality. Welcome to A Third of Your Life. I'm Steve Flamish, and I'm joined by Danielle Phillips Cunningham, an associate professor in the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations and author of the upcoming book, Tower of Strength in the Labor World, Nanny Helen Burroughs and Her National Training School for Women and Girls. Danielle, thank you for being on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. How did you become interested in researching Black history and labor history? And when did you first come across the name Nanny Helen Burroughs? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I first began developing an interest in Black history um, as a um, student at Spelman College. Um, Spelman College is a historically Black college for women in Atlanta, Georgia. And so that uh, experience was really, really life-changing for me um, because we learned about Black history and all the aspects of, of course, Black history is U.S. history. So all the aspects of U.S. history that we didn't learn in high school or middle school. And so I was so um, interested to know about all these things that especially Black women had accomplished um, about their groundbreaking work and how relevant um, their scholarship, their theories, and their activism was to um, social, political, and economic issues that still impact our everyday lives. Um, my interest in Black history also stemmed from growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, a city where um, Black history just surrounds you. Um, as many people know, it's the birthplace of Martin Luther King Jr. So there's the King Center there. Um, and there are many Black people in key political positions. And so that history is just all around you. Um, I also um, had family in Detroit, Michigan and went there for the summers. Um, so a lot of Black history up there as well. So I just grew up um, with an appreciation for Black history and Spelman College shaped my interest, particularly in Black women's history. Um, I first came across Nanny Helen Burroughs' name when I was conducting research for uh, my first book um, entitled Putting Their Hands on Race, Irish Immigrant and Southern Black Domestic Workers. And so while uh, conducting research about the activism of particularly African-American domestic workers and how they fought for better working conditions, I came across this organization called the National Association of Wage Earners. And that really um, sparked my interest um, in learning more about the organization because it was the first Black women's labor organization of the early 20th century. Um, and so I noticed that the the records were at the Library of Congress. And when I went to the Library of Congress, um, I noticed that those records were in the Nanny Helen Burroughs papers. And I said, who is this person named Nanny Helen Burroughs? I'd never heard of her before. Um, and so once I started researching her papers, not only the, the National Associ Association of Wage Earners, but all, everything in her collection. I said, wow, I have to write about this phenomenal, audacious um, visionary. Um, so her, her papers are primarily located at the Library of Congress 
It contains over 10,000 files. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot that I've learned about her over the years. And, um, and I've just been really determined to write her history ever since. Let's talk about her remarkable life. Burroughs was born in Virginia in 1879. Mm -hmm. Her parents were former slaves, and she grew up in the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. What was it like for black girls and black women at that time in American history? Yeah, another good question. Um, it was very challenging um, in many ways. Um, black women in, in terms of labor were excluded from many occupations because of their race and their gender. Um, most black women had to work as domestic workers um, in the homes and the private homes of white families. And um, the only other job that they could get um, was sharecropping um, and, and mostly sharecropping in the Jim Crow South. So um, their occupational options were very limited at the time. And for Black women who were fortunate enough to um, get a, a quality education, um, mostly worked as teachers. So even other jobs were foreclosed to them. Um, even Black women who wanted to leave domestic work um, and wanted more defined work hours um, were excluded from jobs in factories, um, um, as stenographers from many government jobs at the time. So things were really hard. Um, black women also and girls also dealt with um, Jim Crow or who or what Pauli Murray. Uh, referred to as Jane Crow, which is um, racial and gender violence and discrimination at the time. Um, at the same time, there were these enclaves of Black communities where Black women and girls also flourished. Um, so around five years old, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs' mother left Virginia and took Nanny and her younger sister, Maggie, to live in Washington, D.C. And so Washington, D.C. has this long history ever since um, pre-reconstruction of, um, of Black social, political, and economic um, advancement in the, in the nation's capital. So they had, um, had developed and established their own schools and, and banks and stores um, and organization. And so her mother in the, in the book, I write about how her mother saw a future for herself and for her children. And she did what many black women did at the time, which was to migrate to larger cities, whether they were moving from small rural towns in the South to larger cities in the South, such as Atlanta and Birmingham, um, Dallas, Texas. Um, and so some women also moved up north. Um, and so um, Nanny Helen Burroughs' mother was a part of that migration. And while in Washington, D.C., uh, Burroughs had access to a lot of um, Black institutions that helped mold her. Um, most notably, she was um, enrolled in a school called M Street School, which later became known as um, the Dunbar High School, named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, but M Street School was one of the most prestigious um, schools for Black children at the time in the country. It was actually the first public um, school for Black children in the country. Um, and she was taught by many people um, who are recognized today as great leaders, such as Mary Church Terrell and Anna Julia Cooper. Um, they were both leaders in the civil rights movements as well as the women's rights movements. So she, um, so she was really surrounded by um, a lot of uh, Black activism and Black institutions and Black leadership that helped mold her into the leader that she eventually became. 
she wanted to become a public school teacher herself, but、oh. she was turned down for a job in Washington. So she decided to start her own school. And in 1909, at the age of 30, she established the National Training School for Women and Girls. How did she do it? Yeah, that's a very good question as well because. Her her pathway was not straightforward, as you mentioned. She graduated from M Street School with、um, honors,、um, the highest honors in her program. She studied business and domestic science, and and graduated at the top of her class. And she wanted to, as she said, draw a good salary, a comfortable salary, so that she could take care of her mother. Um, who labored as a domestic worker, and so that she could just live comfortably and and take care of her family.、Um, but someone rejected her for the domestic science teacher position, and Burroughs attributed that to her skin complexion and to colorism within the elite black community of Washington D.C. at the time. Um, she also came from a working class background, and so she attributed、um, her being unable to get a job at that time to also her working class background. She applied for a teaching job at Tuskegee,、um, what is now known as Tuskegee University, and、um, Booker T. Washington. Was the president of the school at the time, and he also denied her a job,、um, and she attributed that to her working class background and being operating outside of、um, a lot of the elite black circles at the time. She, a pastor、um, at 19th Street Baptist Church in Washington D.C., put in a good word for her at the Christian Banner. Which was a newspaper run by a Baptist church organization in Philadelphia. So she went there and worked as an editor for the magazine,、um, and then the the organization moved to Kentucky. And so in Kentucky,、um, she moved to Kentucky、um, with the organization, the Baptist organization, and she actually opened a, a prototype. For the school that you just mentioned, that she opened in 1909,、um, this school she opened in the early 1900s, and it was known as the Women's Industrial Club. And she started teaching local um, women um, business courses, as well as courses in domestic science and and、um, millinery.、Um, and so then she decided that. You know, this was just a smaller version of what she really wanted to do, which was to create a school that forged these new pathways、um, for Black women and girls that were foreclosed to them, and to create opportunities such that they wouldn't have to deal with the same hardships, the same discrimination、um, that she experienced. Um, and it was it was a challenge to get there.、Um, she was a part of the National Baptist. Convention, which was the largest black group of churches of of Baptist churches, and the men who were in the key decision making positions of the National Baptist Convention were against her starting the school for women and girls.、Um, they thought that women and girls、um, should not learn different trades. Um, that they should only、um, be interested in learning the art of homemaking、um, and becoming wives, right? So、uh, Burroughs' vision for this school went against all of these kind of patriarchal,、um, sexist notions of what、um, women and girls were expected to do.、Um, but she kept forging ahead. She created、um, a, a network of black women who、um, supported her vision, who fundraised the 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 money to to start the school. It took a lot of money to to build the school,、um, especially in D.C. But there was a, a core group of of women in the National Baptist Convention who traveled across the U.S. 
the biggest fundraising um, event took place in Los Angeles, California. And um, she was able by 1907 to, to purchase the land. And then in 1909 to build the school. Um, and so she and, and those women who became teachers at the school literally cultivated the land with their own hands because this was a rugged piece of land um, that many people did not want. <laughs> and so they laid concrete, they they um, uprooted trees, they literally um, cleared the land for the school. Um, and so in 1909, she opened the school with five students and eight teachers. Um, the students were from all over. They, um, there was one student from Haiti, one student from South Africa, and the other students were from the U.S. South. And within two years, she had 108 students at her school. How big was the school? How many buildings were located on that site? Yeah, um, over time, by the 1920s, um, there were over eight buildings at the school. And, and the school first started in um, a really unstable, um, you know, physically unstable um, farmhouse, eight room farmhouse. And they, and she grew the school into eight, um, uh, eight buildings. And so she actually lived on the school's campus, which I think speaks to her dedication to the school and how much, um, how much she invested in the school. Um, I think it's important to mention that she did not draw a salary for the first 30 years that the school was open um, because she did not get any support from the National Baptist Convention and the money that she was able to raise with um, who I call her co-organizers of Black women who really supported her vision. All of that money went back into the school. Um, so by the 1920s, there was a, um, a building, there were several dormitories, um, there was a building for a couple of buildings for the classrooms. Um, she started her own printing department, and she actually started her own newspaper on the school's campus. And the name of that um, of the newspaper was called The Worker. <laughs> and I think that speaks to how much she really uh, was determined to change the working and living conditions of Black women and girls at the time. Um, she started it in 1911. And um, I found the subscriptions to The Worker at the Library of Congress. And um, my and I counted the subscriptions. So within a year, she had over 500 subscribers, um, and across the country, these were um, um, people who subscribed to the newspaper in, in small towns, towns I've never heard of before, <laughs> um, to huge towns like cities, Los Angeles. There were also subscribers to the paper in Cuba and in Haiti. So um, she wrote a lot of um, articles about um, the particular um, labor injustices and um, racial injustices that Black workers were facing at the time. And she used that newspaper to inspire activism and organizing around those issues. Um, and the printing department and the laundry department, she also had a laundry building on the campus. They, they served multiple purposes. So many of the students who attended her school were working class like she was as a student, and many of them could not afford tuition. So they worked their way through school and they worked in the printing department, they worked in the laundry department, for example, and they earned um, money for their tuition, but they also um, gained practical hands-on experience in learning these trades that actually they had been, um, many Black women had been barred from. Um, and so, yeah, it was a it was a fascinating campus, <laughs> um, and it was huge by the the nineteen twenties. You've written that Burroughs built the National Training School as a laboratory. 
She yes. wanted to improve the working conditions of black domestic workers like her mom, but mm -hmm. she also wanted to open new career pathways for black mm -hmm. women and black mm -hmm. girls. So how did she incorporate those desired outcomes into the curriculum? And how did that go over? Yeah, that's that's a good segue question because I'll, I'll pick up where I left off in terms of the, the printing department. It was it was unheard of for not only black women to work in printing departments, um, but to actually own um, print shops. <laughs> And so it was her vision um, and, and she was a writer, um, which you mentioned earlier, and she really wanted black women and girls to um, be able to own their own um, um, publishing houses as well as um, print shops. And um, so she infused that into the curriculum um, by creating um, work opportunities for students to work in that um, department. Um, she also wanted students to have access to um, government jobs. And so um, she created um, um, stenography courses, um, Black history courses as well. She was big on racial pride and students having a firm sense of themselves and their history. Um, so even as she created domestic science um, courses to help improve um, Black women's working conditions and domestic service, um, she did not create the courses in a way where she taught students to be subservient um, to white employers. Um, she wanted students to, um, to enter whatever profession that they chose with a, a strong sense of racial pride. As one of her students remembered, she would tell students all the time, hold your heads high, like you're the queens of Ethiopia. Um, so she was uh, really big on that. Um, and even the domestic science curriculum was scientifically based. <laughs> so she was not only teaching students um, how to, for example, serve meals, and clean clothes, but the actual scientific or the chemical composition of foods, um, the physical um, composition of the human body. So she wanted students to have this firm sense of food as, as science <laughs> mm -hmm. so that students could also become domestic science teachers and so that um, they could take this knowledge back to their own communities and their own homes and live um, as healthy lives as possible given all of these structural inequalities. Um, she also later um, into the 30s, um, she had courses that taught students how to become barbers. Um, as we know, you know, there are not many, a lot of women barbers today, <laughs> but she wanted students to even break into that field and just have as many options. And this did not go over well with a lot of men. Um, Booker T. Washington um, was against um, what was called a blended curriculum. So um, learning not only trades, but also academic subjects. And he just thought that, you know, women should only learn um, domestic um, subjects. But then there were also um, women, black women at the time who um, Burroughs was very close to, who supported this blended curriculum and created, you know, um, curricula of their own, blended curricula of their own. So Mary McLeod Bethune, um, who just got a statue in the U.S. Capitol building, um, was very big on um, um, creating a, bl a blended curriculum for girls, women and girls. Um, and um, Anna Julia Cooper, who actually taught Burroughs at M Street School. She was big on that. So Black women were on board. They were forward thinking, <laughs> but there were some men who were just really resistant to that. And um, Burroughs was very big on supporting her school primarily with donations from Black communities because she didn't want white philanthropists to dictate to her 
how she should design her curriculum. Um, and so she was primarily concerned about uh, white philanthropists who thought that Black women and girls were incapable, um, inherently and intellectually incapable of learning um, scientific subjects <laughs> and learning um, you know, social studies, being taught social studies um, courses, and as well as learning about history. Um, so she created this blended curriculum um, primarily with support from other Black women because of the backlash from some Black men and also white philanthropists at the time. And what's so interesting about that to me is that she helped to fund the National Training School with small donations mm -hmm. from Black women, mm -hmm. whereas Booker T. Washington, her critic, he had the support of white philanthropists at <laughs> Tuskegee. Yes, yes. He did. He did. And he actually predicted that um, I, I came across a letter actually um, in an archive a few years ago in which um, Booker T. Washington wrote a letter to Nanny Helen Burroughs and told her, um, I don't think that your school will survive because a school that is just that primarily um, is is supported by small donations um, from black communities. It's just impossible. It just won't survive. And her school lasted until the the late twentieth century. <laughs> 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 so she had she she struggled though. She struggled a lot. It was amazing in terms of what she was able to accomplish, um, but it was also very difficult because she had to constantly um, um, prove to people and, and justify to people that this type of school for this very progressive kind of forward thinking school for black women and girls was important and would benefit society overall. Um, she constantly had fundraising campaigns. There were times in which um, she was not sure where um, the next donation would come from <laughs> because it, it was difficult. So she dealt with more difficulties um, than Booker T. Washington, um, but somehow she forged through and, and, and just kept um, but people kept donating to the school and she, and it lasted until the, the later part of the 20th century. Tell me about the student outcomes. Did her graduates make inroads into some of those professions that were previously walled off to black women? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, she liked to talk about a student named Susie Green who she met in Alabama and who was a, um, a part of a sharecropping family in Alabama. And she recruited her to um, the NTS and, and Susie worked in the printing department and, um, and Burroughs encouraged her to, in fact, Susie didn't want to work at first in the printing department. She wanted to learn um, horticulture, which was another uh, course that that Burroughs designed um, at the school. So she took that course as well as you know, she worked in the printing department. And after she graduated, um, she started her own um, print shop. And she was the first Black woman in Washington, D.C. to own um, a print shop. And she owned it for several decades. Um, so that's one story. Um, Burroughs also included um, arts courses in her curriculum, music and acting courses. And one of the graduates of her school um, was named Ethel Moses. And she became um, a, a popular um, Harlem Renaissance um, actor. She was in several Black films and, and documentaries. And she was one of the first Black women to integrate um, movies um, at the time. So she was someone else who just became well known. And she was based, um, after she left the school, she graduated from the school, she went to Harlem. And that's where her, her acting career just really um, blossomed. 
So those are two examples of women who broke into fields that really were foreclosed to black women. What terrific success stories. Burroughs had to be so proud of them. <laughs> yeah, she was. She definitely was. Um, in her um, advertising pamphlets for the school, she told lots of stories of, of women who, um, who forged the, their own pathway. She was also proud of students who became domestic workers. Um, she um, was always critical of people who had um, classes or elitist ideas of, of what people should do um, in their lives. And so she also bragged about a student who she came across um, on a train that she was riding from DC to Philadelphia. And the student's name was Beatrice. And um, she was a, a, a graduate of the domestic science program. And what she admired mostly about Beatrice is that she left a domestic um, service job that did not provide adequate um, housing and living wages. And Burroughs attributed um, uh, Beatrice's um, sense of self and resistance to those um, working conditions to the program. And um, she was proud that she left that job and sought another job and, and secured another job actually in Philadelphia um, that offered uh, much better wages and um, working conditions. Um, so the, so she always made a point of highlighting um, the, the wide range of, of jobs that students were able to get after leaving her school. In 1921, 12 years after she started the National Training School for Women and Girls, Burroughs authored a new chapter in her mm -hmm. life story. She established the National Association of Wage Earners. Mm -hmm. Danielle, you've described this as a little-known but important black women's labor organization of the early 20th century. What was the National Association of Wage Earners? Yes, she started the National Association of Wage Earners in, in 1921. It was the first Black women's labor organization of the early 20th century. And it was the first Black women's labor organization that came closest to becoming a labor union. And that is pretty significant considering the long history of racial and gender discrimination in labor unions and the exclusion of Black women from other jobs. So the fact that, um, and also this organization came before organizations um, that were started and run by domestic workers. And, and so those organizations really emerged during the late 1920s into the 1930s. So the National Association of Wage Earners was a precursor um, to those organizations. Um, it was the first organization really dedicated to improving working conditions and domestic service. Um, that was unheard of at the time. Um, most um, labor unions at the time were only interested in improving the working conditions, primarily of white uh, men in factory jobs and in industrial um, jobs. And also um, the National Association of Wage Earners was unique in the sense that the majority of the members were domestic workers, um, but also a large percentage of the membership included um, black women and men from a variety of occupations. Um, so one thing that I really enjoy um, doing is going through those membership cards and they're all at the Library of Congress and, and looking at um, the professions of the different members. So there were members who were dentists, who were insurance agents, who were teachers, um, professors, who were farmers. Um, some members of the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, the organization that A. Philip Randolph started, um, the first Black 
labor organization that became unionized, um, they were members of uh, the NAWE. Um, there were um, beauty culturalists who we now call hairstylists who were a part of this organization. So I, I think that, that the membership cards um, and the composition of the, of the National Association of Wage Earners really reflected um, this coming together. Um, it was like a labor movement within itself, a black women's labor movement within itself. And considering that men and women were a part of, of the NAWE shows, just how badly it was needed at the time. <laughs> um, so they had a shared vision across these different occupations. She and her co-organizers enlisted 1,800 Black women and men from across the country, 37 states and Washington, D.C., to mm -hmm. come together in this effort to advocate for, quote, a wage that will enable women to live decently. Mm -hmm. What was the outcome of their advocacy? Well, um, part of the outcome was bringing together all of these people. Um, and for a short time, particularly in DC, um, the wages of black domestic workers went up um, because of the, DC was really um, the, the organizing center of the organization. She um, bought a headquarters, which, is, um, which was a huge house that actually is still there in DC. Um, and that became the headquarters and, and known as the district union um, of the National Association of Wage Earners. And so um, they uh, registered a lot of domestic workers in the city and, um, and they were able to, to increase their wages. Um, and in some ways this organization, although um, it never became a, a federal or federally recognized labor union. In many ways, it operated like a labor union. Um, employers who wanted to hire members of the National Association of Wage Earners had to agree to um, certain working conditions stipulated by um, the NAWE members. The NAWE was also successful at creating a sharing profit enterprise. They had their own factory where they made uniforms as well as tools for domestic workers. Um, a lot of times some of the, the tools that they needed to do their jobs, um, they had to purchase on their own and they were expensive. Um, and so she created a business within the headquarters <laughs> in which um, the members shared the profits. So um, it was a way to also supplement the wages that um, they earned from um, their jobs. But also the, the employers had to agree to a standardized wage. Um, so that was something that the NAWE accomplished. And the NAWE headquarters also hosted education campaigns for the community um, about the particular um, uh, labor issues confronting Black women at the time. So they they succeeded in also creating this, this forum where the community came together to uh, various lectures and discussions at the headquarters um, to talk about and to organize against all of these systemic inequalities that impacted Black women's lives. Um, and lastly, they were successful at creating um, a safe place for Black women to, to sleep at the time. Um, there were um, a lot of Black women who migrated through DC um, and in search of better working conditions and jobs, but could not find um, safe housing. Um, and so the NAWE headquarters also doubled as like a hotel um, where Black women could stay um, for free and, um, and could stay there until they could get on their feet. So by the early 1920s, Burroughs is running the National Training School for Women and Girls. 
and the National Association of Wage Earners, but she's not done. She becomes <laughs> a prominent voice for voting rights. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, many Black women could not vote because of Jim Crow laws that were in effect during that time. And so um, Black women and men, um, you know, this was part of the Black experience, especially in the South, but also in parts of, of the Midwest and, and all over the country. These Jim Crow laws prevented Black people from exercising their right to vote. Um, in some cities, you had to pay a poll tax. Um, black people were charged a poll tax. Um, and also Black people were uh, forced to take these erroneous and, and just random um, government tests that the people at um, the polling locations um, could not pass themselves. <laughs> um, there's also something called the jelly bean test. And so some Black people who tried to vote were um, denied the ballot until they guessed the correct number of jelly beans in a jar. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and so there were all of these you know, just impossible, almost insurmountable barriers um, to voting. And also, you know, something that's important to, to say is that um, Black women and men faced uh, violence. Um, Black women and men were lynched for trying to vote. Um, they were harassed. Um, Black women in particular, they were fired from their jobs. Um, especially if they labored as domestic workers. Um, they were fired from their jobs if they tried to vote. Um, so there were real threats um, just in terms of, of legally, but also socially, just on an everyday basis um, that prevented a lot of Black women uh, from voting. In 1924, Burroughs co-founded the National League of Republican Colored Women, most mm -hmm. black people at the time were registered Republicans. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that organization. Yeah. So she um, and, and other black women um, of the time were not silent about um, these Jim Crow laws and these acts of, of violent intimidation um, towards uh, black women and, and men. Um, in terms of, of them trying to, to vote. And she started the National, um, <laughs> she started the uh, National League of Re Republican Colored Women out of frustration um, because the Republican Party at the time, it was uh, uh, progressive, you know, relatively progressive. Um, it was seen as the, the party of Lincoln, of Abraham Lincoln. Um, but even then, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs, as well as her co-organizers, such as Mary Church Terrell, Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells Barnett, um, were frustrated with Republican lawmakers because they were not forceful about passing an anti-lynching law. And that really upset them because they said, hey, we're out here stumping for your candidates. We can't even vote but we're out here stumping for your candidates. Uh, we're getting you all elected and you can't stand with black people and, um, and stand up to the Democrats and pass an anti-lynching law. We're being you know, killed in the streets. You can't do that. And so they decided to start um, the National League of um, Republican Colored Women um, in a meeting um, that they had at a school in Chicago. Um, and they elected this core group of Black women. It was about 100 Black women. Um, they elected Burroughs as president. So as president, um, she was the spokesperson for the group and they operated semi-autonomously. So they were still aligned with the Republican party, but they said, hey, we are going to represent Black women's interests. <laughs> and we are going to be that powerful voice that um, articulates and that pushes 
black women's interests <laughs> since we can't depend on you to do that. Um, and so she created surveys, questionnaires, gathering all of this research and information about um, how you know uh, black people were intimidated from voting and and this wasn't only just in the south she sent um surveys and questionnaires to people throughout the midwest um the west as well as um in dc and parts of the northeast as well um and so they used the the research that um she collected from these questionnaires and and brought them to Republican lawmakers and to the president, um, US presidents and said, what are you going to do about this? Um, this is how we're organizing and um, the government needs to do something. So in many ways, they're like um, black women today, black women, so Stacey Abrams, <laughs> you know, her work comes out of this long lineage. And she acknowledges that this long lineage of black women's political organization. And uh, Burroughs, she met with lawmakers. They actually um, demanded a meeting with um, President Coolidge and they presented their findings to him. And um, they told him, if you do not uh, support um, our interests, if you do not um, do something about voter suppression, uh, we will no longer support you or the Republican Party. So they, <laughs> um, so she was definitely a force to be reckoned with, and so was that organization. Danielle, as I listen to you describe what Nanny Helen Burroughs was fighting to achieve as an educator, labor leader, and suffragist, I'm struck by the inequities that remain a century later. Many black children still grow up attending underfunded schools. In many places, black people are disproportionately concentrated in low-wage jobs. And we still have voter disenfranchisement. Yes, we still do. And so a lot of the inequities, the systems that Burroughs was fighting against, we still see that today. And so I think there's a lot, even though, you know, her activism occurred um, several decades ago, there's a lot that we can still learn from her organizing as well as that of um, Black women who she worked with at the time. And, and it shows how forward thinking they were and how they laid out this blueprint, really, for how we can tackle these issues. Um, that still confront our country today. Um, and so I think this is an exciting time, especially to really move on um, this vision that they had for the country, because for the first time in, in decades, um, conversations about economic justice, about voter suppression, um, that is coming to the forefront in many ways because of the um, George Floyd protests, um, because of um, Black women um, who have been appointed to key economic positions in um, the Biden-Harris administration. Um, so this is a time to really you know, move on um, many of the demands that Black women have been making for well over a century. All of this, all of this that they've uncovered, their research, um, I think it's important to, to learn from that and to take their intersectional lens. Um, they were some of the first Black women, um, especially Nanny Helen Burroughs, in terms of approaching um, policies and policy recommendations and research from an intersectional perspective, right? So looking at the ways in which race, class, and gender inequities um, shape all of these um, institutions that contribute to all of the problems that you just mentioned in terms of education, um, uh, uh, jobs that don't pay living wages, um, housing discrimination, environmental racism. Um, all of this is impacted by that. Um, and something that I mentioned earlier, which I, I have to admit, I didn't think we would be back at this point in our country, uh, but that is 
practically the outlawing of Black history and teaching Black history in our schools. Um, it was illegal in many um, uh, places when uh, Burroughs was teaching Black history at her school. And now we're seeing that resurface. Um, so there's a lot that in, in terms of education as well that we can learn from um, what Black women did to address these issues um, decades ago. Well, Nanny Helen Burroughs did so many remarkable things in her life. She also wrote several plays in the 1920s. During the Depression, she served on President Hoover's Committee on Negro Housing. She actually chaired the committee. And she established a cooperative right there on the campus of the National Training School, the Northeast Self-Help Cooperative. So many different aspects to her remarkable life. And Danielle, I'm struck by the selfless qualities of Nanny Helen Burroughs. She devoted herself to her work. She never married. She ran the National Training School for decades without accepting a salary, as you mentioned earlier. And you write in your book that she literally ran herself ragged. She suffered from a stress-induced illness. I'm glad that you highlighted that because that is also uh, connected to the specific issues that Black women face today, which is taking on the world <laughs> um, and, and um, organizing against all of these different stressors um, that impact um, our everyday lives. And, and I think it's important to remember how even great leaders were also human at the end of the day. And so she accomplished a lot, but I also think that it's important to remember her frustrations and her disappointments because those areas point to um, some things that still need to be changed um, and some things that were problematic at the time. Um, as um, Black women sociologists have long documented, um, you know, Black women tend to um, suffer from um, um, health conditions. Um, so from chronic health um, conditions, um, as well as uh, maternal mortality, um, because of um, them fighting um, all of these barriers that, and some of the same barriers and issues that Nanny Helen Burroughs um, encountered. Um, and I also think it's important to remember what she did during the depression because she was engaged in labor organizing outside of labor unions. And so starting a cooperative um, was something that she did to uh, to help unemployed Black people at the time. And Black people, because of pre-existing um, inequities, were disproportionately impacted by the Depression. Um, and so that cooperative provided jobs for over 200 um, Black people in the, in the local community um, and also provided health services for Black people who could not afford um, quality health care at the time. Um, so as she was creating all of these resources for um, Black women and girls, as well as the communities in which they live, um, she paid a price for it in a way. Burroughs died in 1961, right before some of the seminal events of the civil rights movement. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's sad that she did not live to see those moments, but her work really foreshadowed all of it. Yes, it did. It foreshadowed all of it. The organizing, especially the organizing that took place behind the scenes, to make um, those legislative victories possible. Um, she was in the, in the middle of all of that organizing. <laughs> so while she didn't get to see it, I think she was able to see some 
progress while she was alive. I think that she got some energy and inspiration from working with um, other leaders of the time who helped make those um, pieces of legislation, those key pieces of legislation possible. She was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s mentor. They worked very closely together. Um, A. Philip Randolph, head of the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, who was instrumental in the organizing of the March on Washington. Um, they worked closely together. So she was able to see a lot. And, um, and she also talked a lot about being happy that her school um, would survive her. Um, so her, her legacy definitely lives on and it lives on through um, the organizing of Black women today. I think she did more in one lifetime than most people would do in two or three. And she <laughs> could easily be the subject of a Hollywood film. Yet her name is not mentioned alongside Dr. King, Booker T. Washington, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer. Why do you think that is? And why should more people know about her? Yeah, I think part of it is because she was outspoken. <laughs> she was outspoken for her time. And in the early 20th century, um, women, especially Black women, were not expected to um, be outspoken. Um, and she was never afraid to speak her mind. She was also not married. And um, some women um, who were married had some social protections in terms of how they were seen and perceived. Um, and, and so she was not quote unquote protected in that way. Um, she actually refused to get married. She was proposed to twice, um, but told both men, I am married to my work. Um, she did not have children. And, and so she was, uh, she was ridiculed um, for that as well. So she she challenged many conventions, social conventions, in terms of uh, what education should look like for girls and in terms of uh, what women should do and how they should be and how they should act. Um, and so she did not um, go over well with everyone at the time. So that's part of the reason. I also think part of it is the gender construction of how uh, traditionally how we think of, of labor leaders. Um, it's, it's a masculinized construct um, and it's seen as it's kind of um, closely aligned with um, industrial male jobs, right? And so the, these great labor leaders and labor union leaders um, were uh, mostly white men who uh, fought for um, labor rights in factories, for example. Um, and here she was, she was a black woman fighting for um, black women's labor rights and especially domestic workers. So people who were outside of that industrial realm. Um, and so she is mostly remembered as an educator, which is, you know, within this feminized occupational lens. Um, but I think that her life speaks for itself. And she was definitely a labor leader who contributed um, to many labor movements in this country. Your book will certainly raise awareness of her life and legacy. It's called Tower of Strength in the Labor World, Nanny Helen Burroughs and Her National Training School for Women and Girls. It's coming out later this year, and I'm looking forward to it. Danielle Phillips Cunningham, Associate Professor in the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations, thank you so much for being on A Third of Your Life. Thank you, Steve. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to A Third of Your Life, the Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations podcast. For more information on our academic programs, faculty, and research, visit smlr.rutgers.edu.